I'm going to try something at mind when I do this hearing. Um, so are we good? Yes. We good? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll start with a, a kind of introduction to me. Um, could you mute your Discord? Yep. Because I'm getting a lot of feedback. Okay. I can do that. So if just turn my volume down to. Yeah, it's mute. It's mute. <laughs> um, okay, so. Um, now, so my name is Simon McCall. Um I'm a, a lecturer, so I was, I was in music where you guys are uh, for 11 and a half, well, for nine years, um, having been in, a lecturer in New Zealand before that. Um, so as a New Zealander, I sometimes say that I'm, I'm, I'm all the things that people know about New Zealand. Um, so I think actually, can I unmute you? I think I can eye on you so I can listen to you. Um, so, but here we are, I, I, the, the three things I say is that um, I'm, I'm my grandfather was a sheep farmer, because you know that New Zealand has a lot of sheep. So um, I, I was that. Um, I'm flightless, like the Kiwi. Uh, and also I was an extra in Lord of the Rings. So I was a wild man in the Lord of the Rings. And so when they put two horse, two, two children on a horse and ride away from a burning village, I'm one of the bad guys burning down that village, right? So I'm, I'm kind of a typical New Zealander in a lot of those places. Um, I came to where I am um, as a, a lecturer and game developer, um, and so I created a lot of the game courses, and that, so that's why there's an undergraduate degree at New York in game development. Um, as part of that, uh, we were teaching how people how to be good programmers. Um, and I started programming when I was 10, which is now 35 years ago, um, and did my first professional programming when I was 16. So I've, I've been a programmer basically all of my, the life that I can remember, I've been kind of programming things. Um, so for me, uh, this kind of, how, how do you get better at being a programmer? How do you work with large pieces of code with other people and get something that works? So, so that's what I've been, been um, studying for most of my life. Um, now, I've, I've come back to New Zealand, which is why you're getting this, the, the Skype version of me, or the video conference version of me. Um, and I've, I've started lecturing here, but I'm still 20% in Norway to, to kind of help with these sort of things and finish off some of the teaching and, and courses that I was doing in the, at ICR. Um, so if we look at what you guys are doing with this Applied Computer Science project, uh, for some of you, it's the first time you're starting to work in a, in a standard team um, and working on a, a, a team developing software uh, rather than doing individual work. Uh, so I, a lot of the students who've gone through our degree uh, did a lot of, of group work and uh, did a lot of version control and talked about a lot of the ways that, that professional groups work together. Uh, what we've noticed is that for a lot of our students who come in to do our masters, um, their undergraduate degree often didn't include a lot of those, the tools and the, the structures and the systems for the professional programmers. They were taught how to code, but not kind of how to code with other people. Um, so uh, one of the things that we look at, and, and if I move to, to screen sharing, I can actually start the presentation. Um, and if you have any questions, um, you've got a few options. Um, well, at the moment, we're just on a direct um, uh, Discord chat, but you can put your hand up and harass um, Marish, and, and he, will, he will turn the microphone on and ask me a question. Um, or he can type in a question if it's in the middle of the flow or something. Uh, so I'm quite happy to take, take any questions and stop at any time. Um, so if I now go to screen share, I'm going to give this a go, and I go share screen, and so you can now see that, and if I turn off, uh -oh, if I turn off the camera, 
and go screen share and go share, that puts that there. Can this then go to screen share? Aha, right. There. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm, I was gonna give that a go as you get to still see me, but now I'm the small version of me next to the, the slide. Um, is that, that's working? Yes, I, thought, I think I saw a thumbs up there. Um, so I'll just make that a little bit. No, I can't make it a bit. Okay, that's right. Um, I'll just make that. Just a there we go. Okay, so we're talking about, oh, and if I bring that onto screen a bit more so you can actually see that we're talking into you. Yay. Um, okay, so I'm looking at that at code control and semantic commits. Now, um, I can only vaguely, I, I can, can only see you guys um, with your hands up, so I can't see all of you, but um, how many of you have used um, GET and version control? Aha, excellent. Um, so that was one of my assumptions is you guys had heard of version so, so we're, we're good with that. Um, so if we have a look, what I was looking at, um, talking about um, code control, was the idea of, of moving from just missing code and, and getting moved into smart commits and talking about the difference between temple commits and semantic commits. Uh, and, the, and, and automating the process and automating sort of continuous integration and testing and kind of those professional practices around committing the code. Um, so hopefully we'll cover some of that. If if I'm going too fast or too slow, if I'm going too slow, kind of, you know, get me to move faster and I'll try and get through things quicker and we'll see what questions you have about this area of, of code control. So the assumption I made was that you are familiar with, with Git or some form of distributed version control. There are other assumptions that we need to make. If if we believe that this is, is an important area, then um, your projects have issues that you want to solve. Um, that you want to record information at the time the code is created so that it's easy to remember what's going on. And that the logging process is of some importance, right? So if nobody cares how your project, project developed and you don't have to submit anything and nobody's watching and nobody's doing anything, then yeah, maybe you don't need to log anything and you don't need to, to have commit messages and you don't need to do it professionally because nobody cares about the process. Um, and that you might want to debug this later, the code that you're working on, you might want to debug it. So for that reason, you want to be able to, to have good logs to know where things came from and why they're there, and that helps you fix things, right? So if those are sort of projects that you're working on, then you want to go beyond just um, standard version control and start thinking about how you use version control to make um, your, your projects better and to make the process better. Um, so, Okay, well, we'll quickly go through through Git. So Git is a distributed version. You've got to remember it remembers chain change sets, not versions, right? So in fact, calling it a distributed version control system is a little incorrect because it's not a version control system. It's a change set control system, which can be used for versioning. Um, and so the idea is that it, it links sets of changes, and so um, those changes can be linked to issues or discussion items and, and those changes can be analyzed and decided to be merged in or not based on what the group feels is important for the project. Um, so hopefully you've, you've seen this, this standard uh, repository push, like using the, the idea of, of cloning things to a local repo, editing them and uploading them. Right? So you've got lots of these uh, now standards, GitLab, Bitbucket, and, and GitHub are all fairly standard systems. You can use them in the cloud. We are using them um, gets.yurvik.ed.ntnu.no. So lots of dots and lots of weird letters. Um, but that's a local um, GitLab install, uh, which is the full enterprise version uh, of GitLab, uh, and allows you to do a whole bunch of really interesting things. Um, some of which you probably don't need to do, so you probably don't need a service desk because you've probably not got customers 
for your project who are wanting to email problems to you that you then respond to in a, in a standard enterprise level way. However, um, a bunch of the continuous integration stuff and the issue tracking and project tracking and milestones and burn down charts, um, you can do in GitLab, as well as Jira, the other tool chain that we have is the Atlassian tool chain. So, so we have a full stack on GitLab, we've got a full stack on Bitbucket, Atlassian tool chain, and uh, GitHub is our kind of open source external tools that we use. Um, so there is a, uh, you could almost call it a religious um, on the difference between command line tools and GUI tools. So off the class that I can see, how many of you prefer command line tools? How many of you prefer GUI tools? Ah, <laughs> so, so there's a bunch of GUI preference for GUI tools rather than online interfaces. Um, ah, how the, how the lady are you guys? <laughs> I saw I saw that, that, that okay, so, so quite a few of you. There's a couple of stuff um, um, command line and a, and a couple of, of GUI people and a bunch of command line interface people. So um, so when we look at command line, Git Bash, hopefully you're all familiar with Git Bash and you're using Git Bash and you're you're able to that. Um, there are some things which Git Bash and command line is a little bit trickier for when I talk about state interactive staging of components. Um, so when you guys have done get and done commit, how many of you use the the interactive get um, stage staging? So you can you can commit interactively. Have any of you used the get bash interactively? The delay here does seem to be quite enough. Right, okay. I can see a wee bit more in the class now. Um, so, yes, but uh, the, the delay on, on, your, on, on the video does seem to be that you know, we've got a few seconds delay now. Uh, maybe it's building up and you're buffering me. Um, so, the idea of running Git Bash interactively is that you can see each of the changes interactively. Now, I use source tree, which is a pretty GUI, which shows you all of the parts of the files that you're changing as you're changing them. Uh, and you can select some parts to commit and stage. Now, you might think, well, why, why would you, I, I can understand why you might stage whole files, but what's going on with the selecting only parts of the files to stage? So, so, we're gonna, so, so if we look at something like source tree, so this is an example of source tree, again, you can see it here with, with a bunch of, of different branches. Uh, so hopefully you've, you've all used branches. Um, now, for your projects, we don't require you to use a particular branching strategy because there are several branching strategies in Git, um, though you should have a justification for your branching strategy. Um, and so if you're doing issue branching, you branch it up, change it, merge it back in, that's fine. If you're using a dev branch and a master branch and a networking branch or something, and you do, rather than individual feature branches, you do whole topic branches, that's also acceptable. Um, so so there's this idea of, of visualizing branches. It's quite nice to have a, a GUI tool that shows you, uh, and in this case, where, where you are in terms of the, the masters and, and like the master branch and which origins are pointing at which points of the tree. So here, um, down, down halfway down the page, you see the yellow markers down the middle here, which are the, um, where the original, where my master is, right? And you can see there have been updates on other branches that it can see that I haven't, um, that, had, that master hasn't been updated to include. Um, so hopefully that you, you guys are also therefore all familiar with the first uh, the first part, the first touch of cloning, then you pull, do some editing, you add the files, you use a commit message with, with commit message, uh, and you push, right? So you're all totally familiar with that and um, we can now go on to branching strategies specifically. Yes, so am I am I right you're all familiar with that? I'm wondering how long this delay is. 
seems to be a teensy. I'm getting some nods, yeah. That's <laughs> okay. Okay, so it is okay. So with these commit messages, when you're looking at, at staging commit messages, um, uh, if you're doing semantic commits, so so you've often when people are first doing development, when they commit things, they do it after a while, right? So you're, you're sitting here, you're doing some work. You then commit, you push it up the repo, you go home and pick up where you left off by pulling, it, uh, by doing a, a fresh pull from the repo, and you continue working at home. And then, you know, before you go to bed, you you commit and push it up and go to sleep and get up in the morning. And then, you know, someone else has done a pull and they've been adding some stuff, and then they've done push. Um, if you're doing that kind of temporal approach to commits. Those commits don't really have semantic meaning. They just are, oh, this is what we did at about four o'clock yesterday. Okay? Now, that has low quality when you start looking at the, the commit history. And if you go back into the what was being seen, because you know, your commit message is things like, you know, end of work commit, um, or you know, going home commit. And going home doesn't tell the code anything about what's going on. So the idea is to move away from, from having those kind of temporal commits where you're doing you're using the, the version control system kind of merely as a, a save and and um, like a storage uh, and actually start thinking about linking information about what's going on with commit messages. Um, and that's where uh, we have, have things like the smart tagging. Um, now, in, we have two stacks for you to investigate, um, and you can, you can build your projects in either one. So we have a, um, a GitLab slash GitHub style, which uses a hash and a number as the way it connects an issue to uh, a to, well, commit, a commit to an issue. Or we have the JIRA approach, which uses the short name of the project and the number of the issue. Okay? Now, these are two, di two different systems. They're basically doing the same job. They are connecting um, information at the time you commit code with some sort of issue. Okay, So this becomes then an issue tracking. Um, uh, integration with your code commits. So when we look at, at, at um, the staging, um, you can see here we stage things, you can see the edits uh, are coming in. Uh, if you're doing interactive staging and get in source tree, what you do is over the, over the right hand side of the slide there, so just oh, that way, just down, down, down there, <laughs> you can see the um, red and green. So they sh are showing you which parts of these files are being changed. Now, in source tree, I can actually interactively go, like, can, um, stage what they call a hunk, which is a part of a file that's been edited. Um, now, that makes sense once you're saying, OK, well, why would I commit only part of a file if I made a whole change and I've tested it? Why would I commit everything? And the answer is, well, if you've made some changes which connect to an issue or connect to a particular thing you're trying to solve. You may have also solved another problem at the same time, but you want to keep the lines that solve one problem separate from the lines that solve a different problem. And so rather than just folding them all together and putting them into a single commit, you actually stage just some of the files, and even within a file, just some of the lines that you change. Um, and so under this principle, um, we are documenting what we're doing. Um, we are separating code changes when we do it to why we're doing it. Um, that the time is least important to many. The additional time spent in creating the code um, will save on time when we go to maintain and fix them. Now, as you guys are mostly trying to get code out, um, this idea of making code that's maintainable for that, that you could debug later seems a waste. However, you're now at master's level, 
and we expect you to be more professional, and so we expect you to start thinking about the whole software life cycle and start thinking about what is the maintenance and, and debugging and understanding of the code. And so that's why we look at, at maintenance debugging for the largest chunk of time. Um, so, smart commits. Uh, so we commit connecting to an issue. Um, now, a few years ago, we actually had some professionals come in and mentor us as lecturers, uh, and we did a project. Uh, and one of those mentors was um, working for on, on a system that had four users in total. Four. And there were only ever going to be four users for the software that he was developing, or that his company developed. And he had a very large company, multiple, multiple developers. Um, and the system was the electrical power grid for Norway. And there are only four people who can turn off the power to Oslo. Okay? And so as an interface, that's mission critical. You make the wrong button in the wrong place, and suddenly all that electricity fails to, to Oslo or fails in different parts of the country. And so you, you really want that to be secure. And as part of that, the idea that if you touch code, you have to have a reason to touch it. You don't just go in there and hack away at it and get in there, oh, I'm just going to make, and just tinker with the code and then commit that code to master and have it roll out to the electrical grid, right? It's only when there is an issue, there is a problem that you are being paid to fix and, and that you've been assigned to say, right, yes, the, the users have identified this problem, we're going to have to fix it, we're telling you to touch the code to fix it. At that point, you're allowed to touch it. So if you're working in those professional environments, there's none of this, you know, tinkering with code and, you know, just, I'll just play around with it until it works and, yeah, oh, I'll quit. Um, and, you know, you you kind of vague, you know, oh, yeah, I'm, gonna go, I'm, I'm doing some AI stuff. So you go in there and you start changing some AI stuff, you change some AI stuff, you then go, Oh, I'm about to commit. Oh, I can't remember what the issue was. I'll just call it, you know, oh, AI stuff and commit. Yeah? Doing that means that when someone looks, okay, who paid for that line of code to be edited? What was the change request that came from a customer that is generating income for our company that meant we changed that line of code? Yeah? Now, if you can't answer that question, how can you charge your customer for the work you've actually done? Eh? Um, and so for companies, they don't want you to just tinker with code for a bit. They want you to have an issue, and they want to. Every line of code you change, you need to associate that. And so that's why Jira has this you know, um, short name with number, or GitLab, GitHub have a hash and a number to connect those issues to the code you're committing. Um, because otherwise you are just tinkering this and you can't charge for that. Um, now, if you look at the Jira stack we have, um, so uh, we, yeah, as I said, we have two stacks. We have the Atlassian stack. Uh, we already have some Jira projects from previous years. You can see here there's uh, some 2018 ones um, and uh, earlier 2016 and 2017. Um, these are Jira projects. So this is on our, this is from the um, Dev IMT board. Um, so Jira is a professional project management tool. It has a full stack of um, Jira as a tracker. Uh, it has Confluence as a wiki, and it has Bitbuckets as the um, underlying Git repository tool. Uh, we also now have GitLab, which does everything in one system. Right, so it's kind of an integrated. It's not as powerful, it doesn't have as many tools as Jira, but it covers the same um, functionality as Jira does. Right, so when you create issues in Jira, so how many have, have, have any of you used Jira uh, or other issue tracking systems like GitLab and GitHub for doing issue tracking? I know there's going to be a bit of a pause until I can get response. Uh, okay, there's a couple of hands up the back. Oh yeah, oh there they go. Yes. Mm. So we've had some people use those issues, and we're using smart commits in your get commits and com connecting your commits to those issues. Okay. 
Yes, now that does seem to be about a 10 second turnaround. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll assume some of you did. Um, so uh, I'll just have to keep talking, I think. Um, okay, so with Jira, we create issues and we have a default schema that allows those issues to be grouped. So there are things like bugs and features and tasks and improvements and stories um, and epics. So epics are supposed to kind of be the, the big things that cover large whole topics of the, the um, project. Um, user stories are often used to, to add, add features, um, kind of, but as a kind of a, a, a user journey. So when you can often you use stories which are, include multiple functions within a particular sequence of tasks, right? So you tell how the user does it a whole bunch, like does, but that will probably touch on a whole bunch of individual features. Uh, and then you have, an, as we go up, you have things you're going to improve, tasks that need to be done, features that are adding, and bugs. Now, um, I've actually started using, and, and I've, I've encouraged uh, Marish here to also use um, GitLab, these project management tools, as our teaching tool. So when, I, when we teach something to you, if you think of it like a project, and I teach you something, and then you don't know it, that's a bug, right? That's a bug issue, and you can raise it. And initially, you raise it, and you try and fix it yourself, studying some more, and if you can't fix it, you then raise that bug up to us as lecturers, because then it's our job to fix that bug. And the bug is that you have been taught something, and that the teaching hasn't worked. Right? So you can actually do a lot of what we do as lecturers in this same kind of project-focused way. Um, we also look at, at doing estimates at the time. So what we expect you to do is when you create issue, you to estimate how long that's going to take. Now, one of the challenges of, of doing estimates is, is also for many, you may not have done a lot of the estimating how big the tasks are. Um, because often for undergraduates, we do as, as computer scientists is we work out how big tasks are and we carve them up and give them to the students at about the right size. Right? Uh, and we try not to make them too big or, or too small. Uh, and so this, this ability to estimate how long things take is a skill that you probably not had as much opportunity to develop as you would in an in industry and as you would in the real world. When we give you real world problems, with no idea of how big they are. Is it a one week problem or is it a two year? We don't know. We hope that it's a one week problem. Um, but that idea of, of you being able to look at it and go, okay, I know that it's going to take me between 40 and 80 hours. Right? Um, so this idea of time estimation. Uh, there, there are two types of estimation. Um, and uh, if you're going to use uh, GitLab, then it just has a weight that just combines everything into something it calls a weight. In Jira, you can have both story points and hours. So you can say how, how complex something is, as well as how long you think it's going to take. Um, now, that idea of story points, uh, and, and ha how many of you have heard of story? So what story points are is they're the idea that um, when you you estimate how big a task is, um, what you've got to do is you've got to actually go, okay, so, so rather than just, I think it's going to take two hours, you work out how complex it is, and you say, right, this is kind of two units of complexity. And then what you say, well, you know, I've got, I've got a really gun program in the team, and they generate two levels of complexity every hour. And I've got a beginner programmer in the team, and they generate a unit of, um, of complexity every two hours. So a two-unit job will take my gun programmer one hour, and will take my weak programmer four hours. Okay? So that's because they're just they work at what's called different velocities, right? So this idea of how fast you're able to add complexity to the project. So there's this idea of separating out time from some measure of complexity or, or different, uh, and saying, well, actually, can, can we estimate 
the difficulty independently of its main time. And then we just accept that some people will take longer to do something than other people. Uh, and so JIRA has this story points model mode and a, an hours mode. And in GitLab, you do it all by waiting. So if you're going to do it by waiting, you kind of have to decide, are we waiting by hours and just assume we're all the same scale? Or are we waiting by complexity? And we say, well, you know, we'll do some planning poker, we'll work out some numbers, and we'll try and work out how big a task is. And then once the group has agreed how big it is, if you're really fast and you work really hard, you can get high velocity and get through a lot of that weight quickly. So it's not how, how long you work, it's how, how kind of well you work, right? So that's, that's quite a different way of thinking you start estimating how big your task is. Um, so one of the things that, that JIRA does give you, um, have any of you used JIRA before um, in your previous days? So one of the things that JIRA does um, is that rather than just having tags and saying, oh, all of these labels, are, all of these things are just tagged together, right? um, those people, I don't know if in using JIRA, you went down to this level of actually creating the, the workflows through JIRA, where um, you actually say, OK, when an issue comes in, what state does it start at? And this, this slide, we start in a, in a node, we go to open, and open is our first tag, our first state. And then it has how you move from open to in progress, and then from in progress to blocked, or down to in review, or back to open. So it actually maps out where issues can, drop, can go and how they move through an organization, and can label um, these transitions with different button labels so that when you when you when you have an issue you can see up oh, blocked by external you could say there is a uh, an external button and you hit external and it moves it the blocked waiting for external input so these are uh, ways you can configure and control your development environment to help you as developers um, with that flow how you break things into their categories. Um, so that talks about the stages you can be in the transition between. You can decide who's responsible, so who's allowed to move an issue from one place to another. You, you can actually encode in the transition diagrams. Uh, it provides an overview of your system for the new system within your organization. And swim lines are this idea that, that there's a whole bunch of issues that you might want to separate out. So if you've got a whole bunch of user interface issues, you might set it from line to development issues. Uh, and so these kind of workflow tracking. Uh, in GitLab, you have, it, it's simpler, right? GitLab, it, although it's all integration, which is lovely, uh, it's not as, as broad as um, Jira is as a process management tool. And so you lose some of the flexibility, like having um, story points and hours. You just have weight. Uh, you don't have as, and you can't configure the boards as much, and you can't configure where things go and control those. So you have to kind of accept a, a bit lighter weight system if you choose to use Git. If you choose to use GitLab. So, but for most of you, GitLab will be enough. But if you are honestly wanting to learn the kind of in, uh, one of the industry standard tools, then putting the extra effort into learning G the JIRA and Confluence and Bitbucket systems uh, are, well, I don't even know now if they're more used in industry, but they're certainly a, a, a heavier process, and so you do learn more about process by, by using those tools. Um, so hopefully, so as you guys have been, you, Issue tracker, some of you have used issue tracker, you would have seen a burn down chart. So, for your projects, we expect you to eventually get to a burn down chart like this, um, but not early in the process should you have a burn down chart like this. Um, so, this is, is a, a story point burn down chart where it's coming down and you can see weekends are blocked out, so they're not working during weekends. Uh, and this, this, this burn down chart works pretty well, it comes down quite smoothly. Um, what we usually experience in this applied computer science program is in your first burn down chart, you come in for a bit and then you jump up high and then you spin on and then you 
come down a bit and then you end the sprint with only about a third of the things you said you're going to get done done. Um, and so your burn down chart doesn't really look car that burns down it, like you know a cityscape that goes up and down for a while and just ends at the end of the sprint. Um, we know that, you should be aware that we know that. Um, what the plan is to get you better at planning and better at doing sprint, better at working in these projects, so that eventually by sprint four or five, you've started to use the tools properly and you've got nice burn down charts that are actually looking like your estimating task and putting them into your backlog and actually getting them done in small enough charts, right? Because one of the things that students often do is that they'll just do um, one big task and it's kind of, oh, great, I'll just make a big task and then I'll be done. And so you get this horizontal line and the big task needs to be done, needs to be done, and then it's all. And so you don't get this, this indication of progress, you just get a big square, um, which isn't really very useful for anybody tracking the project. Um, so there are some interesting visualization tools. Um, so when you're developing things, they're, they're, um, it's not just a case, you look, um, what you individually do. Um, it's also thinking of, of how do we how do we visualize project yourself and how do we visualize the process. So what you'll find is that there's quite a few um, tools built into things like GitHub. Um, Atlassian has a few tools itself to see when can you. Um, one I found recently, and Mario should have seen this, is is Gauss. Um, so uh, or Gauss or it's like source, but with the G. Um, have any of you seen Gauss as a version control visualization? Because um, what I'm going to do is I will actually go into docs and so I'll, I will bring it up, um, seeing that I've, I've um, oh, where is my uh, explorer? Uh, no. Um, where did I put it? Um, uh, and so I, you can, you can download this course that I have. Um, so if I open the file location, um, so what course does is, is something very interesting. Um, if I, there's the thing. Um, so I've got the, the, the course um, executable that I just downloaded and installed on my machine. Uh, and then I can, um, and I, you can, I can use it, you can run it from command line. Um, but I also have my git lab repos, and git lab repo, and um, actually go down here and go git lab repo, and go into the VR, and so we've had a, a, a the VR teaching environment that I'm, um, we've been using for a while, uh, and it, so it was developed by students. Now, if I drop it, drop that project onto the executable, it will spin up this as a interactive visualization of the creation and development of this project. So what happens here is you can see there's little guides here. So these are individual students. There's Hova um, who come in and interact with the project as a tree. And so over, um, so the idea is that you have the very start, each um, branch of a tree is a folder, and all the leaves are the file within those, right? So you can see there are some um, folders that have large numbers of files. And then it tracks the version control and sees that coming through, and the students come in they go around, they touch a few files, they add some files here, they modify files. And so what they're doing is they're, they're kind of, you, you can see this as the, where does a student come in? Where does a developer come in? What are they touching? What are they adding? Where are they using code? Okay? So this is kind of, kind of fun visualization for seeing people editing the structure, modifying the structure, adding of, of a project over time. Um, and so this is, this is kind of, as a, as a way of thinking about what your project looks like and how people interact with it. I thought this is quite a cute, fun, animated visualization, right? So when you think of, of visualizing code, it's not just a matter of visualizing it for um, like a, 
a bar chart or a, a circular chart. It could also have the, this daily interaction. And you can see actually the time running across the top is the, um, the time of day running in March 17th. So it actually, it's tracing what these people are doing in not quite real time, but it's, it, you can trace through it. You know, you go further along, and it will just view what's happening in that area of the, the repository, right? Which is why you're seeing just just the branch created at that point, someone creating and, and adding and removing files, right? So um, this is an interesting way to think about and, and visualize um, file handling. So, so no, but I thought I'd show you that because I, I think it's quite fun as a visualization that you guys can run on any repo. You, you run the code on the repo and it generates this video view of the tree structure and the way that someone's coming in and interacting with the file. Um, so I thought that was fun. Um, now, with that visualization of code, when you annotate code, one thing to find in GitLab, uh, and you, you do find it in GitHub and, and in Bitmark as well, is this either called annotate or blame. Part of the reason why we get you to comment on code is so that when I go to blame someone for why code is where it is, you can go and look and see all of this kind of stuff around the the lines of code being edited by different individual students and what their commit message was was when they put it in there, right? So what, what was the commit? When was the commit? Why is this code here, right? Um, now the reason why you, it used to be called annotate and is now called blame is that it used to be, oh, we just got annotated with, with who wrote, um, but it was always used to blame someone for destroying the, the or for, for putting a bug in the same, right? So you want to say, who, who wrote that line of code and blames which, right? So that's why it becomes blame rather than just annotate. Um, so uh, that is the end of the first section of my talk where I was talking about GitLab and Git issues. I want you to use the smart commits. I want you to link your issues to your Git commits. I want you to think about what you're committing and make those semantically meaningful. Um, there are uh, the links that I've given you in um, seminar take you through some of how to do some of those semantic commits. Uh, if you have questions while you're coding, um, you need to let us see the repository so we can comment on your style and your process to help you improve your process while you're developing the project. Right? So don't try and hide this from us and then present at the end of the sprint. Oh, look, isn't it perfect? We've got to look perfectly. Show us as you go, and we can help you improve the, the quality of your process during the process, rather than just waiting to submit at the end of a, uh, a sprint, or or thinking that you know, um, you're know you going to kind of hide everything under a bushel and then each other perfectly working. We're not so interested in the perfectly working song. We're interested in the process. That's why we want you to, to work on these, these ways of annotating, ways of connecting issues, and waiting issues, giving them a time frame, and, and looking at that part of this thing. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys a few minute break, a um, few minute break, uh, and when we come back, we'll talk about code reviews and um, how you don't annoy people too much when you tell them their code. So we'll see you guys. Get up, walk around, and we'll see you in 15 minutes. And unless there are any specific questions you want to ask. Any questions you might have? Right, so I will uh, break the view for the break. Okay.